Okay, Khan and Venturi, and we'll get a uh, very rough overview. So, Louis Kahn is, uh, oh, what should we say? He's a classical modernist, we'll define what that means, but goes much further into a spiritual depth. He says, a great building must begin with the unmeasurable, must go through measurable means when it is being designed, and in the end, uh, must be unmeasurable. So we're going to see what that means. Venturi says, okay, Mies van der Rohe is famous for the, quote, less is more. Venturi says, less is a bore. And this is his most important project, House for His Mother. And our first reaction might be, what? Uh, and we're going to find out why it's important. And we're looking at two very different architects here, and you're totally welcome to say, you know, I care for one and I don't care for the other. So we'll see uh, at the end of the course what you think. So we'll very briefly look at Louis Kahn, and we'll do that some more um, next week. First thing we want to say that Kahn is both a practitioner and a teacher. So if you think of like Peter Eisenman, he's a teacher, he's always taught, but he also does buildings. Uh, on the other hand, someone like Ian Pei, Ian Pei did not teach. Um, he just practiced. So some do both, and Khan did both. So here he is uh, in his studio. And then here's Khan at a jury. Here's Norman Rice, who was classmate of Khan and the first American to go work for the Corbusier in the 30s. Here's the dean of the school who put the Philadelphia school together. We'll talk about that, G. Holmes Perkins. And uh, this was not the architecture building, it was the library, but Khan moved his studio up here in this beautiful space upstairs. In, it's called the Fisher Fine Arts Building. It was the furnace library when I was there. But somebody named Fisher gave him a lot of money. So, And the first thing we want to do is put both of these architects, this, this is happening in Philadelphia. And there's something called the Philadelphia School. And when is it? Maybe 1955 to 1975. Um, it's, uh, depends on how you define it. Actually, uh, I've written a book about it. But it was characterized by a synergy of city, profession, and education. Now, what does that mean? That, if you think about it, Pratt's located in New York, but what does that mean? You know, maybe it means we can go to the museums. Uh, but here's what went on in Philadelphia during this period. The dean of the school was Perkins. He was chairman of the City Planning Commission. The director doing the actual work of the City Planning Commission was Edmund Bacon. He was on the faculty of the school. Uh, Edmund Bacon in the City Planning Commission, they didn't rebuild the city. They didn't have that power. But what they did was, they said, you know, this sh should happen here. Well, you need an image of what should happen here. He would hire architects to do a, um, a representation of what he, Bacon would, of what he was proposing, and those architects would be from the faculty. The profession, they were important architects in Philadelphia, but after World War II, just getting out of the army or getting out of school, there's a new generation of young architects just opening their offices. They were drawn upon to be the faculty. In school, all of our projects were located in the city of Philadelphia. So, oh, we're going to do a community college. It's on this block downtown. So we go there and we say, well, where's the subway stop? Where's the bus stop? What's across the street? Uh, we would have a sense of an urban context for what we were doing. So the school, the city, 
and the profession were completely intertwined. All this happened, uh, the school in particular, uh, but the leadership, uh, even for the city, was by the dean, G. Holmes, per G. Holmes Perkins. So <clears throat> until 1950, the University of Pennsylvania had been a Beaux-Arts school. We'll talk next week what that's about. But uh, it put it right behind, because Walter Gropius had come to Harvard in the 1930s uh, and brought modern architecture from the Bauhaus. And uh, actually, Perkins and uh, Hudnut and Gropius ran Harvard. And when Penn wanted a new dean, they, they got Perkins from Harvard. So um, he's the one who put this together, had a vision of this integration and that a school of architecture should include architecture, city planning, and landscape architecture. The three of them were interrelated. Pratt's trying to do that, but we don't have room in the building for landscape architecture. But we have city planning and architecture in this building. City planning, urban design, um, give it various names. Now, uh, the city was undergoing renewal. So Philadelphia had been under corrupt single party rule for decades, like 50 years. And the city had decayed, fallen into um, decay. And it was being renewed. There were new city planning projects. There was a revitalization. This is all taking place under the leadership of Edmund Bacon, who was on the faculty. And then um, what else? There's something else. But anyway. It was an, oh yeah, uh, so there's an article in a, the New Republic uh, intellectual magazine on the rebirth of Philadelphia. It was around 1962, maybe it was this article. And it said, the intellectual center of the city of Philadelphia is G. Holmes Perkins School of Architecture. Didn't say the University of Pennsylvania, the School of Architecture was the intellectual center of an entire city. And Philadelphia is small. Uh, all of downtown Philadelphia here, it, this would be the tip of Manhattan. It's about the size of Wall Street, the financial district in Manhattan. So it's comprehensible. You can get a grip on it. You can actually walk from one end to the other in about three hours. Um, it's handleable. Now, we'll talk about more of this, about this next week, but uh, when William Penn got the charter for Philadelphia, he laid out a plan for five squares. It's called Penn's Five Squares. The center, the one, two, three, four squares around the center. And over the years, as it got developed, and then in the 1920s, they built this diagonal parkway to the museum up on the hill, which is also done in the 1920s. That's the museum where Rocky runs up the steps in uh, uh, the movie. And so it's, um, uh, again, something comprehensible. Now, we associate the school, it's at Philadelphia School, Con and Venturi, but there were really exciting figures there. Jurgo was a brilliant Italian intellectual, Robert Geddes uh, went on to become Dean of Princeton for many years. Robert LaRicola is sort of like Bucky Fellow. He did these weird experimental structures, French uh, engineer. Stanislav Nowitzki was um, uh, taught basic design, uh, was Polish. Ian McCarg is the inventor of modern ecology, uh, and he was the head of the landscape architecture department. Denise Scott Brown came there as a graduate student with her husband who died in an auto accident. She later married Venturi. But she brought English and European city planning ideas to America and integrated them with American ideas. And Edmund Bacon was uh, 
redoing the city of Philadelphia. Philosophical concerns of the Philadelphia School. A broad cultural orientation. Architecture is based in a larger intellectual setting. History is a physical and ideological continuum. We're embedded in history. Uh, building concerns. The urban context. A background architecture. Uh, it's sometimes appropriate that your building, that a building sits out like a sore thumb, but probably not your building. <laughs> you know, it was like you you act, you acted respectful for the existing context. Plan is a giver of meaning. Uh, less interested in section, more interested in plan. Use of masonry, articulation over integration. We'll talk about that. And structure as an order, ordering element, rejection of the Corbusier's column grid. So that's the Philadelphia School. And if you're really interested in all this, and it was too quick for you to write it down, I'll put it online later. And uh, you can also download the slides. Slides are already online. I'll go show you those later. So Louis Kahn uh, was born in Estonia to a poor family that immigrated to Philadelphia when he was five. And um, he studied, he ended up going to the University of Pennsylvania, supported himself playing, silent movies were silent, so you had someone playing the piano as the background for the movies, and he, that's what he did. And it made, he supported his family and put himself through school. And when he was at Penn, 1920 to 1924, the chief critic was Paul Philippe Cray, a wonderful Beaux-Arts architect. We'll look at his work uh, actually in the next slide. He graduated in 24, just as the Beaux-Arts was fading. And uh, then it's not until uh, about 1960 that Kahn does the medical towers of 57 to 60 that he emerges as an important architect. So he's a late bloomer. So when he studied, it was in the Beaux-Arts tradition. We'll have a whole talk on the Beaux-Arts next week. But um, real simple. Beaux-Arts architecture is buildings with columns. So who can name the important Beaux-Arts buildings in New York? The Metropolitan Museum, another one. Say again? Museum of Natural History. Museum of Natural History. The, the Central Park facade, not the rest of it, but the Central Park by John Russell Pope, who's the architect who did the Jefferson Memorial. Another one. 42nd Street Library. One in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Museum. OK, so it's buildings with columns. This is Cray, beautiful little building just across from the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., the Pan Am building. And then later, he does, the, in Washington, Cray does the Shakespeare Folger Library. Kahn worked on that building. Now, the Beaux-Arts would work on a competition method that if you were uh, a Pratt student in the Beaux-Arts tradition, and we would take the best design projects and send them to New York, schools from all over the country, and there would be a competition and you get prizes like the Rome Prize, the Year Scholarship to Rome, uh, Paris Prize, etc. So we'll talk more about Beaux-Arts architecture. So the 1950s and 60s is when Kahn comes into his own He's doing work in the 1930s, we'll see that, but it becomes important in the 50s and 60s. And what was going on? Who was the dominant architect in the US? Anybody? No. He had, actually, it's interesting. Frank Lloyd Wright had been banned from all the schools. Uh, they didn't like him. Schools had been taken over by the Europeans. And they were jealous of Wright, so. Mies van der Rohe. 
We like to say Mies was a lion standing in the path of all the architects. So 1958, Mies, well, the late 40s and, and into the 50s, uh, Mies does important buildings in Chicago. But then 1958, does the Seagram building, and it like cements that style, the glass box skyscraper. To this day, we very much uh, respect that building. But um, what do you do when something is that dominant? And there's three things you can do. You can surrender to it, say, OK, I'm going to do glass boxes. You can deviate around it. You can say, I can just ignore that. I'm going to do something else. Or you can wrestle with it and attempt to defeat it and say, you know, here's its limit. I'm going to do better. I'm going to show you where it fails or is limited, and I'm going to do something better. So people surrendering to it are SOM in the Lever Building. Now, the Lever Building is earlier than the Seagram Building, but it's not earlier than Mises Glass Boxes in Chicago. So, But uh, SOM works in the Miesian style of the glass box. Who totally ignores it? There's something totally different. Saharan. It's like, screw that. Okay, what glass box? I'm going to make my building look like a bird. <laughs> uh, so this is the TWA building. Now, what's the wonderful thing just now about the TWA building? Yeah, so it was it totally got outdated as a terminal. It's nowhere near big enough for today's modern airports. It's uh, I don't have the year here, but it's about 1962, 63. It's going up when I was in school, so we were we were looking at it. Actually, I saw it being built. Um, lines of tr concrete trucks out onto the highway as it did the whole thing in one continuous pour. Um, but it's a total, let's just do something totally different. Let's just ignore it. Although, <clears throat> Saarinen does other buildings that are totally missing. Uh, the uh, General Motors uh, research headquarters outside of Detroit. But I would say Rudolf wrestles with Mies. He says, I'm going to show that Mies is thin and it's substantial. We need something more muscular. So he directly takes on Mies and challenges him with the Art and Architecture Building at Yale, also around 1962. It's a very fertile years. You get the Kahn's Medical Towers, Rudolph's Art and Architecture Building, Saarinen's TWA Building, all around the same time. And also challenging Saarinen is um, Kahn. And he says, the Seagram building is like a beautiful woman in a corset. Says, you know, you want the curves. And they're all laced up. This building has diagonal bracing, air conditioning ducts, piping, uh, mechanical. Um, and you don't see any of it. He just hides it all in a sheath of glass. You should express what the building's all about, which is what he does. Where's the structure? Oh, here's some little feet of the column sticking out. It's, everything's hidden. So here's the structure. Here's the fire stairs. Here's the mechanical. It lets everything express itself. So it's a, one of the challenges to Mies. He compares his building to Mises. So Real quick, we're going to do a whole half a semester on Khan, <clears throat> but we'll just do an overview now. So, medical towers. Here we are at the back of the building. And looks very articulated. A lot going on here. He wants to be very clear. None of this is arbitrary. He's not just putting bumps on the building to make it more expressive. I'll go through this step by step, but he says, science has two parts. Uh, there's working at the lab tables, which he calls measurement. And then 
you go away from the lab to the light, to the window, to work on your notes, to think about what does it mean. So that gives him this space. Then we have to hold it up. We don't want, we want this free and flexible so we can move the walls around. We don't want any columns in here. So the columns go on the outer edge. You don't want any columns in the corner because you want to have your view out. So that means what's left is putting the columns on the third points. Now, we'll look more at the Seagram building uh, in two weeks. But in an office building, you put the core in the center, elevators, stairs, toilets. So you have around that your flexible office space all at the windows. Khan doesn't want to put anything in the middle because he wants it open and flexible. So he's putting the he's putting access, fire stair, exhaust ducts on the outside. So the middle won't be cluttered. <clears throat> and you don't want them in the corners because that's where our views out are. So they go in the third points. Now you have three of these to get the space you need, and they all share toilets, stairs, storage, elevators, the common spaces. So this very articulated looking building with all this stuff going on is not arbitrary. It's built out of and the program the structure, the materials, and the spaces. And then how it's put together is just mind blowing. It's all prefabricated. Giant precast concrete beams lifted into place by these cranes. And I'll tell you how it's put together, how the columns are assembled, and how these beams are assembled. So where have you seen a precast concrete building? Higgins Hall Center, right. Very much inspired by this building. And then the mechanical, um, Kant says, I hate mechanical. I'm scared of mechanical. But I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to give it its full expression. So air comes in here goes up these tubes into this giant air handling room, monster machines in here, then goes down through ducts into a given lab floor, and then is exhausted out these tubes, these towers. So the building is a diagram of the airflow through the building. His next building is the Salk Institute. So Jonas Salk had developed the polio vaccine. Polio was a horrible disease and everybody living in fear your kid's going to get polio and die or have a withered limb. And uh, I'll tell you more about why there was an epidemic. And it's a virus, so you can um, uh, hopefully develop a vaccine for it. And without any government money, the government wasn't in that business at the time. Jonas Salk was hired by the March of Dimes, and he developed it. So he became a hero, and he wanted his own uh, research center. And he got this land in La Jolla, California, and invited Khan to do the architecture. Here, um, he alternates lab floor, mechanical floor, lab floor, mechanical floor. So these are giant verandales, like trusses. I'll tell you the difference that span across these columns and then can't leave her out. And it's so, these verandales are so deep that you can run all the mechanical in there. 
and then boop, drop down what you need to your lab desk. Two wings, and these are offices or studies for the scientists. Now, Khan refer refers to form and design. <laughs> form does not mean shape. Form means the underlying organizational principle of a building. Design is the shape, how you carry out that form in this particular case. <clears throat> the medical towers and SOC share the same form. They have totally different designs. And we'll go into that in two weeks. Another of his key buildings is the Kimball Museum, Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, this incredibly powerful clarity of materials. Here is the structure. Port in place concrete. Here is infill, travertine masonry wall. And it tells you which is which. And then the roofs of these. I don't want to say vaults. <laughs> Structurally, they're not vaults. It's a whole story. So these vault-like forms giving you this, uh, these beautiful interiors. Uh, one of his last buildings finished after he died is the Yale Center for British Art. Uh, very strong three-dimensional grid. And we'll talk about how he gets these spaces. And then finished long after he died, National Assembly Building in Bangladesh. Um, did anybody see the movie My Architect? OK, very strongly recommended. And um, this building is strongly featured there. So a uh, new capital for Bangladesh. I'll tell you how this came about. And what's the most recent Khan building nearby? FDR Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island in New York. So in the middle of the East River. Now, we're going to discuss something. Where does architecture serve? See if I can get a better work. What's the purpose of architecture? To house the poor or to be elite monuments? So let's, uh, let's look at two con projects. So this is Mill Creek Housing, the con did in Philadelphia. This is the library at Exeter. Phillips Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire, uh, an elite prep school. So here is Mill Creek Public Housing. And the um, public housing authorities were trying to get good architects. <clears throat> Rudolph did one in, uh, near Yale. Um, Roosevelt Island here in New York used Philip Johnson, John Johansson, uh, Colin, uh, Colin uh, Rosanth, and the rest of his firm. They try to get occasionally get good architects. So okay, we mix high rise and low rise, some of, and then Khan's kind of using this prefabricated concrete. Uh, floor panels, they project out, so they give you a little uh, shade protection over the windows. 
Well, that's really going to do it, right? If you have precast concrete projecting over the windows, that'll cut down on the crime. Like, what does it have to do with anything? What did they eventually do with the project? They blew it up. Now, New York, as bad as public housing is in New York, it's better than most other places. And Philadelphia, they've dynamited all of it. It's just, they just gave up. And it was so bad and such a dumb idea. And then they dynamited and then they put in little two-story houses and people love them. Uh, I mean, I live on the 27th floor. I don't have any kids. Uh, you know, to use the word, I'm an intellectual. I sit up, I sit in my room and read books. This is cool. It's actually a very nice place. There's two acres of gardening at the bottom. I'm in Waterside Plaza. But if you have a bunch of kids and they want to run out and play, this is not a good way to live. So, for all of Khan's efforts, this was as much a disaster as any other public housing. And it's pretty bad if they're going to dynamite it. You say, well, at least they could, you know, redo it as middle income housing or, you know, turn it something? No, <laughs> dynamite it. Okay, now this is <clears throat> Phillips Exeter Academy Library. Now, we can, we, there's going to be stuff to discuss about this building. And here's this little campus, two and three story buildings, Georgian style. And he puts this huge monster in the middle of it. Well, that was not his idea. He wanted a big library. But uh, he reduces the scale of it. It's a, it's a nine story building that looks like it's five stories. By the way, again, it's the scale. And then inside, it's just magnificent. It explodes into this, it's like the Pantheon, into this uh, incredible interior court. And then to the perimeter is surrounded by these little study cows. Why is that plane so low? So where does architecture serve? Does architecture serve social and political policies? Or is architecture the manifestation of institutions that are the embodiment of human desire? We'll discuss that. And obviously, the answer is both. But we can talk about what this means to these people. We'll look at Kant's philosophy. And I begin my discussion of Kant's philosophy with monumentality. Anybody have a definition for monumentality? Have you heard that word in history theory? OK, I'm going to say monumentality does not mean big. Uh, my definition of monumentality is monumentality is the celebration in form of a past that we value and feel is still living in us. So, what's this? Hello? What's this building? The Pantheon, 125 AD, Rome. It's the greatest work of Roman architecture. Now, look at this. This is 1938-1941, National Gallery, Washington, D.C., John Russell Pope. It's a pantheon with two wings. 1941, what's he do? <laughs> I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright, it's already five years after Falling Water, and we're, we're building a pantheon. Why did they do that? Because they felt that Roman values are uh, at the core of us today, meaning Americans in 1941, 
And we want to celebrate and experience that. So monumental architecture is an embodiment and celebration of some aspect of the past that we wish to keep alive in us. Diagonally across the street here is a Gothic church. And it's saying Gothic architecture is a bringing of the luminous presence of God into our lives. And we Christians today, or 1890 when that was built, uh, uh, are using this Gothic style to keep that vision alive. This is a Richardsonian Romanesque building, 1880, that wants to preserve these Romanesque values. Modern architecture rejects that. Modern architecture says, well, the monumentality of the Beaux-Arts, this is a Beaux-Arts building, as are Metropolitan Museum, 46th Street Library, Grand Central Station, the Brooklyn Museum, are saying we want to keep Greek, Roman, and European values alive as they are the origins of our culture. Modern architects say, didn't the Roman Empire end uh, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> 1,500 years ago? Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it time to get over that? Are we in a modern world that we build not on Greek and Roman values, but on science, rationality, technology? And so modernism rejects monumentality. The program is modernism is to make a new human being and a new society, reject the past in European <coughs> culture in favor of a universal materialist culture rooted in science, not the past. Therefore, modern architecture rejects monumentality. What's this building? Thank you. Walter Grupp is the Bauhaus, 1924, which I'm taking as an example of modern architecture. Now, um, Modern architects rejected monumentality, but then they had a problem. In the middle of World War II, there was a lot of people died, you know, like 20 million, something like that. Um, why were we fighting World War II? Well, you know, for survival, although it wasn't likely Japan or Germany were going to get to North America. Um, had a couple of oceans there. We were fighting to preserve certain values. Well, if those values are so important that we're fighting this war costing billions of dollars and millions of lives, what are those values and why aren't we celebrating them in our architecture? So there starts to be a rethinking of the rejection of monumentality. Well, they don't get very far. Can't really figure it out. But Kahn eventually figures it out. He says, we're not looking for monumentality. We're not looking for a new appreciation of the past. We're looking for order. And order does not mean lining things up. Order means the underlying principle of all things. And that becomes the foundation of his philosophy. So I'll leave it at that. That's what my book's about. And we'll do a whole two lectures on that philosophy, where it comes from and how he builds it. But he can't say what order is. It transcends description. So how do you describe something that you can't describe directly? Poetic metaphor. So Kant's poetic metaphor for order is silence and light. I'll explain what that means. OK, more quickly now, wrapping up. 1960, something happens. The whole world freaks out. <laughs> 
Uh, it was really cool. Go into that a little bit. Uh, but if we go back to uh, 1932, there was a show at the Museum of Modern Art called The International Style. And that introduced European modern architecture to the United States. The glass box and the white box. The glass box of Mies, the white box of Corbu. Two key buildings in the show. Uh, Corbu's Villa Savoie, Mies is Barcelona Pavilion. <clears throat> and by 1958, that architecture is dominant in the United States. It gets slowed down by 1932, fine, but then we're in a depression. Then we might get out of depression, we're in a war, World War II. When we get out of World War II, finally we can start building this. We get the Seagram Building, which is to this day a fantastic building, no criticism, except everybody started doing it. They start marching down Sixth Avenue. People, uh, is this really uh, <laughs> what we want here? And they start looking at other stuff. Like that. Now, for the mid-1960s, you want to get really wild. What am I going to show you next? This is getting cool. This is Archogram. And I remember this drawing was up. This, this is before modern reproduction. So this actual drawing was pinned up in an exhibit in my school. And I'm looking at it, I'm saying, are they allowed to do that? <laughs> Whoa! So this is picking up on all these techie ideas, <clears throat> temporality. Um, you build a core, and then you plug in your apartment units. So here's someone getting a new apartment delivered. Uh, and it's going to plug in, called Plug In City. And there's a whole, I mean, I do a whole course in this, but... Um, in the middle of all this comes Robert Venturi. He was born in 1920. He just died. Um, it was last month at his memorial. Educated at Princeton, taught at Penn, and briefly at Yale. He was regarded as the father of postmodern architecture, though he liked to deny it. I'm a modern architect. He totally ignores me. And when me says, Less is more, Venturi says, less is a bore. And he worked with his wife, Denise Scott Brown. So it's Venturi Scott Brown is the firm. Some of the early stuff is his on his own, but she was, when he was working on his book, she was reading it. They were already dating. You know, but she didn't become a member of the firm until later. So he does this book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, and we're going to read parts of it and discuss it. And now, complexity and contradiction would be the opposite to what? What's the opposite of complex? Simple. What's the opposite of contradictory? Direct. So modern architecture was simple and direct, clear. It's telling you what's going on. Venturi says, why? Well, because that's honest. Well, where, where did honesty become a value in architecture? Well, what's so good about honesty? Well, if that's a college, we should know what it is. Why? <laughs> and he does a book just blowing it all away. And... Uh, uh, totally revolutionizes architecture. And then he does. So, who's your first client? Some idiot family member who doesn't know any better and lets you do a house for them. So, Venturi does a house for his mother. <laughs> and I'll tell you why they can afford it when we get, when we get to Venturi. But um, I'm going to telegraph what happens later in the course. Where does this come from? Context. 
And I'm going to talk about why context is important. But historical context. Here is the low house, shingle style. Here's the Chandler house, shingle style. Here's Frank Lloyd Wright's house for himself. Comes right from here. Two bays, two bays, palladium window, palladium window, shingles, shingles. And so he's putting himself in the historical context of Northeastern American architecture, <clears throat> ignoring what the hell does Corbu have to do, you know, some French architecture outside of Paris have to do with Northeastern US, and he puts himself in historical context. Then he puts himself in locational context. What does a suburban mid-Atlantic house have? Slope roof, chimney, window with panes of glass. Slope roof, chimney, windows with panes of glass. But his is mannerist. It's distorting everything. I'm going to talk about what mannerism is. And finally, what if you asked any child to draw a house, what would they draw? There's the house as any child would draw it. Slope roof, slope roof. Chimney, chimney. Entrance, entrance. Panes of glass, panes of glass. This is not... Corbu's house. Now, there's a lot more there, which we'll go into when we get to Venturi. Now, that's Venturi's most important building. Here's his, if you only have these two buildings, you get the whole story. This is his second most important building. This is a fire station. How do you know it's a fire station? It says fire station on it. <laughs> And it's got an American flag. And what do the firemen do while they're waiting for the fire? They live there. How do you know this is where they live? Because this is the window arrangement from Venturi's mother's house. Long window. Big window with four lights. Long window, big window with four lights. And it is, I mean, it goes on. I, we're going to do like just a half an hour on this building alone because there's a whole architecture uh, coming from this building. So any questions about Khan and Venturi?